Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. This is the NetConf Working Group. And um, let me pull up the slides. Hi, Mahesh, this is Captain. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. All right, so I am. See your slides. Okay. Do you see the slides? Looking good. All right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or very late night for some folks in North America. Uh, this is the NetCon Working Group meeting for 109. Um, I, this, this is a note well uh, by participating in this, you agree to follow all the ITF procedures and policies. Um, if you are aware of any ITF contributions that are covered by patents or patent applications uh, that I own the control, you must disclose that fact. Um, of course, you agree to, um, to abide by any ITF uh, rules, regulations, as that pertain to an attendee. Um, more information can be found in any of these links that you find on this page. Uh, just a quick recap on the administrative trivia. Uh, Kent and I will be trying to monitor the Meet Echo uh, chat window for comments. But if you want uh, um, to present or have one of us speak into the mic for you, make sure you preface the comment with mic in the front so we know that it, one of us needs to take it to the mic. Uh, the hum window which is the one that you will use for polling will be uh, is right next to the chat tab on the left side uh, no need to do any virtual blue sheet signing meet echo will record your presence um, when you need to queue up to ask any questions uh, make sure you raise uh, click on the raise hand icon and um, we will then uh, call you and put you on the queue to speak. Make sure you unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon with the play symbol, All right? Um, Jabber, um, we'll talk about it on the next slide. We do encourage minute takers, uh, as many as we can to uh, take the minutes. Uh, you will find the link for the Cody Minute Taker tab on the top side of your screen. Right, uh, for Jabber, I have this link uh, to use if you want to set up Jabber. And don't ask me too many details. Uh, they, whatever information is there probably is what does, um, I use to set up Jabber. But uh, also note that Meet Echo Chat window will cross post or um, they will cross post to each other. So if you are on Jabber, we will see it on the Meet Echo Chat window. Uh, logs, of course, for the meeting will be available after the meeting. All right. Status of the chartered work group items. Yang push notifications. Um, when past second uh, last call, this has been called the second time. Uh, we are still waiting for a pending authors update. We hope uh, we can get the authors to come back and finish the document. The crypto types, trust anchor, and key store uh, documents are in working group last call. Um, I guess Kent will give an update. Um, something about sector review and author responses uh, and let him speak to it when he 
gives the status update. The client server suite of drafts uh, will go into working group last call once the um, security drafts listed above clear last call. We don't want to inundate the working group with more documents till we have cleared what's on the deck. Uh, HTTPS notification is nearing working group last call. We'll talk about it uh, when I present that draft. Uh, Yang push notification messages again uh, is waiting on HTTPS note of draft. We'll resurrect it once we are ready to send HTTPS notification to last call. Um, the remaining documents are all um, work in progress. So, and we'll hear about them in this meeting. So here's the agenda. Uh, sorry, um, ahead. Before moving on, I see our AD is in the queue. So, oh, all right. I'm sorry, I just remuted. I'm sorry, Robert. Can I just remove you from the queue? Can you go back? Yeah, in? yeah that's fine. Is my audio coming through? Yes. Uh, so just a quick question on the meeting notes. I went to CodeMD, but it gives me a blank new page. It looks like the fact that I've created it. Um, so I can add some meeting notes to that, but it doesn't have the normal structure that you would expect. Maybe uh, that'll need some sorting out afterwards, unless you know. So All that right. actually may be the case. I did not initialize it with any content. Did you, Mahesh? No, I didn't. Maybe, Rob, I can, after I... And when Ken starts speaking, I can cut and paste the agenda into the. Okay, uh, then I'll w I'll wait before I make any notes until you do that. Well, okay, okay, I just pasted the agenda I, into the. Okay. okay, that sounds that's great. Thanks. Right. Um, so we, here's the agenda for the meeting. Uh, Ken will walk through the status and issues with all the client server suite of drafts. Um, including also the security set of drafts. Uh, and in order to minimize uh, exchanging too many screens, again, we'll continue with the CSR bootstrapping uh, SZTP draft. Uh, and then um, I'll take over, followed by Pierre and Thomas. The non chartered items, uh, we have Peng, and, Peng Liu and Chin coming back with the drafts they had presented before. And then we have one new draft from Yan Lindblad, followed by Kent and Chin talking about a list pagination mechanism. There is no draft currently posted. Uh, I guess they will give us an update on that. All right? any questions, uh, any agenda bashing? Anything else we want to see? All right, with that, I'll stop sharing and bring up the next suite of track. Share. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this okay. is the update. Oh no, I'm getting an echo. This is the update to the uh, client server suite of drafts. Um, since ITF 108, uh, just a, a few small high level updates. Uh, in crypto types, we added the password grouping to define a union between a clear text password and an encrypted password. And um, and then you'll see uh, that grouping is now being used in, I think, three of the other drafts. And we also added feature statements for the encrypted formats, specifically um, password encryption, symmetric key encryption, and private key encryption. Those are all now, um, those are the names of the features. I'm sorry, Mahesh, you just dropped out of full screen. I'm not sure if you did that sorry. on purpose. It's okay. 
um, you know, those are the names of the features, and of course, they're controlling whether or not um, the server supports the, the encrypting of passwords, symmetric keys, and private keys, respectively. And also a um, a certificate expiration notification. We we added a feature for that um, for for controlling whether or not the server supports sending notifications when certificates are expiring. In trust anchors, um, and actually, really, for the remaining, uh, the, the, the well, you'll see what the primary thing was is that there was a sector review by uh, Sandy Murphy on the key store draft, but uh, that review uh, had comments that were applicable to all the drafts. Um, I guess you might even say to some degree they were editorial, and uh, so you know the changing and improving the way the content was being presented uh, was reflected in all of the drafts. So that's essentially the, the change that was made in Trust Anchors and uh, in all the others as well. Um, also in the Keystore draft, um, there's section four, which is entitled Encrypting Keys for Configuration, was pretty much entirely rewritten uh, to uh, Present things in a more in a manner that was more acceptable to sector. Okay, next slide, please. Um, moving on, we have the TCP client server. Uh, so here was the case in the SOX GSA API. Where we modified it. Uh, there was a, a field for a password, so we modified it to use the password grouping. And uh, now it's the case that the password may be in clear text or encrypted there in that in that configuration data model. We also added um, there was missing mandatory true uh, in the particular uh, node when you selected whether or not it was going to be a, a, a kind of socks, a password-based socks. It didn't have it that the username and password were actually mandatory leaves. So that got um, added. Uh, I forget who now who mentioned it, but there was a missing registration for the TCP common um, module. So we added that in the IANA consideration section. Similarly, in the um, SSH client server draft, there was the modification to the in the in the client, the SSH client, when you're configuring for password-based authentication. Um, that password was previously only it, it could previously only be Clear text, and now it's using the password grouping, so either a clear text or encrypted password can be configured. In the TLS client server, uh, the in the uh, both the client authentication and server authentication uh, for PSKs, um, it's uh, got converted from being a presence container to a leaf of type empty. There was a number of fixed needs that got cleaned up. And um, yeah, that was the main update. Okay, in the HTTP client server draft, there was also a uh, some fixed needs that got removed in the HTTP client. It, you know, when you're using basic authentication, there's a password. It was previously just clear text. Now it's using the password grouping, so it can be encrypted. Um, and strangely, oh, okay, I see it now. Um, hovering over the screen, it it. Uh, blocks the text of uh, what's being presented. In the uh, both the NetConf and client and ResConf client server drafts, the uh, the same sector review comments were, were reflected there. Next slide, please. Um, so I don't normally spend a lot of time on uh, the changes that were made since the last IETF meeting, because there's usually a lot more to talk about. But in this case, there isn't. Um, there was just the sector review from Sandy, and then um, Yav Nair, Nair uh, submitted a sector review for the trust store draft, which I've yet to work through, um, though the changes, um, the comments that were made there were fairly high level and didn't appear that they would have any uh, significant impact to the drafts. Uh, in general, um, we've been waiting, and we, I sh putting on my chair hat for a so moment, uh, Mahesh and I have been waiting for these first three drafts to 
stabilize from a sector perspective and also from a Yang doctor perspective. I think there's uh, a Yang doctor review outstanding for these drafts. So we're hoping to get that um, those updates sort of completed for these first three uh, core drafts. And then whatever cascading changes would occur, such as the ones you saw already, the Sandy sector review had cascading impact to all the other drafts. So any other cascading impacts would be completed, at which time all the remaining drafts would be ready for last call. Actually, in my view, they're already ready for last call, uh, sans any pot pot potential um, cascading changes that would need to be made to them um, as per the outstanding sector and Yang doctor reviews. And uh, that might be it. Next slide. I think this is it. Yeah, that is it. Are there any questions? Right. If there are none, can we move to the next one? Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. So, Kent, what I'm finding is that my windows get taken over completely if I go into full screen. Um, I don't think you need to go to full screen. Um, Okay, let me try to see if I can share it without going full screen and see if it. So that's what it looks like. Right. I, and that doesn't not look good. It was better before when it was. Okay. Let's see, do, do you have an ability to do play in window as opposed to full screen? Play in full screen versus play in window? Play. No, I don't. Okay. I think anyway. the full screen then is better. Can you do you want to go full screen? Okay, uh, do you uh, see yeah. It? yeah, I see it. It looks good. Thank you. Uh, this presentation regards an update. Um, of course, we just adopted this draft in uh, well, actually, it was one of the, remember, we did uh, the chairs, the NetConf chairs did a uh, adoption suitability, um, a number of uh, email threads, one, you know, I think for nine drafts that were potentially queued up for adoption. And this was one of the uh, one of the drafts that, that went through that, and uh, it, it was adopted. And uh, so immediately I posted the zero, zero, which was identical to the zero one um, from before the the K watts and the ID, um, and that's r really up until Monday, <laughs> just a couple of days ago. That was the officially published version, um, but then I was I, I did a I did a, I did a grep for the word fix me in DVD, and I noticed that I had actually left an editorial note. Sorry, next slide, please. Um, I noticed an editorial note and. Uh, found myself needing to make a quick fix to that. And that's why I posted a zero one um, in that uh, there was in the security consideration section. And so you, the update that you saw posted on Monday was just to for that zero one update. Uh, sorry for that for that edit, to, to fix that mall that editorial comment that I left in the uh, security consideration section. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so when when this draft was presented last time, we had said that the authors had made every effort to for the zero uh, for, for the draft to basically be ready for last call. It was already ready for last call. We had we had taken the time and effort to to do everything, uh, including the security considerations and IANA considerations and everything. Uh, we thought we were done and ready, but then um, one of the authors had an exchange with another ITF contributor from um, 
a different company and not not someone who's uh, commonly in the netcomf working group regarding uh, crmf uh, which is a, a, a microsoft format uh, stands for certificate request message format it's not actually it's not technically a microsoft format anymore it's an itf format but it was originally um, supported by microsoft and they wanted to ensure that crmf was being supported and uh and so we thought that we were going to need to do an update for that but uh, to the second bullet point it turns out that the draft already supports supporting csrs um with the C crmfs and and in particular this the draft supports csrs in three formats uh the first being your standard uh p10 format uh pkcs um, number 10 format and then also cmp and cmc and both cmp and cmc uh, themselves support both p10 and crmf and hence uh, already the draft supports crmfs vis-a-vis -vis its support for cmp and cmc so the, with that uh, resolved um, in, in in essence there was no update to the draft it it turns out uh, other than that editorial knit that i mentioned on the previous slide um, uh, the draft was in fact complete and done and ready for last call uh, previously um, however to bullet point number three the same comment from that offer author uh, sorry itf contributor um, in a different uh, working group spun off a number of uh, some other drafts so you'll notice in the lamps working group a couple drafts by russ housley on um, updating CRMF algorithms and yet another one for updating uh, AES GMAC algorithm. Uh, so these uh, other drafts that are not Netconf specific um, sort of complete the the uh, response that was being uh, made by the uh, other ITF contributor and uh, so it's out of scope to this draft. Next slide please. And so beyond that, um, there is in fact no um, remaining update to be made. If, uh, if there's any comments or questions or concerns regarding this work, um, please mention now. Uh, if not, then I believe this, this draft is ready, or I should say the authors believe this draft is ready for working group last call. I see a comment in the chat window from Rich congratulating for the update. Thank you. I think we're done then. And so I think here, uh, Mahesh is where I'm going to take over being slide presenter. Mm -hmm. All right, so I will talk about uh, updates to the HTTPS-based uh, transport uh, for subscribe notifications draft. Um, there were two updates, uh, one just a quick um, editorial, not an editorial, but a quick update, which I'll talk about um, in 06 that I'll talk about on the slides. Next slide, please. All right, so um, updates since 04, really there are only two main changes. Um, the last update uh, to 06 uh, really updated the security considerations section to uh, bring it into compliance with ARPS 8407. 
And the second change is regarding examples for receiving of event notifications. Um, next slide, please. So I think there were comments received in the last ITF meeting that uh, maybe the draft could do well with uh, an example uh, for receiving of event notifications. There was an example for JSON. Um, we did uh, add another example for XML, the, the corresponding example actually for XML um, in the draft. So uh, with those two examples, and the fact that we have uh, completed the security consideration section. Uh, let's go to actually, I don't have this under the slide. Yeah, uh, so with those two changes, we believe uh, that this document is also ready for working group last call. But uh, rather than us, um, the chair is calling for it, we will both step down and um, See if uh, Rob might take over at this point and see if uh, he wants to do a poll or not. Uh, yes, hopefully my audio is coming through. So I think the first question is, is anyone, um, does anyone have any comments or questions on this before I do a poll to see if people are happy for me to uh, check for work at the last call? So otherwise, then I don't see any comments in the queue. Um, can one of you do, Kent or Mahesh, do a poll, run a poll just to check? So the question is, do other, other people happy for this to go to working group last call? All right, so please. So, so just so people where they know the tabs on the left, um, it's just under the hand icon. It's like three little bars and you can either click to raise your hand or do not raise your hand or, or choose to do nothing. I think I started the poll, but I have a typo. So I, is it started? Yes. Yep. Okay. So it says uh, WGLS instead of WG. Uh, L S uh, C, sorry, but anyway. So we've got ten people that say they're happy if this goes to work. In the last call, there's no one that's chosen not to raise their hand out of thirty-four participants. So it's eleven. I think, I think that's fine. So I think we can, yeah, it's going up slightly. So I think we can take this to the list to do to kick off the working group last call. I will um, work with Kent and Mahesh to work out exactly how what the process should be in this particular case. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rob. So Kent, are you going uh, with the next deck? How do? Yes, I was you know, uh, just saying if Pierre could um, come to the queue to uh, bring up, I'll bring up the presentation right now. It does take a little bit of effort to switch presentations, so that's why there's yeah. a delay. You have to load it and then ask to share the application window. So here, um, yeah, I guess you don't uh, need to share your screen, so I'm going to cancel, but um, you can sure, submit sure. to Go ahead. OK. And now I have it loaded. I'm just about to share the application window. Okay, should look good. Yep, thanks, Maesh. So I'm Pierre from Insalion, and I'm going to present an update on the UDP notif draft, uh, joint work with uh, Guanying and Tianran from Huawei, 
Thomas from Swisscom and Paolo from NTT and a bunch of developers who worked on this, uh, notably last week during the hackathon. So next slide, please, Marish. So I'll make a quick reminder of uh, the goal of the draft. Then I'll uh, show the main difference with the dash zero zero, uh, trying to cover the most important comments that we received on the mailing list since then. Uh, then the main point is uh, to shut the, my mic and let you guys discuss and take notes on this. So next slide, please. So uh, the main use case presented on this draft is to allow for uh, routers with distributed architectures to publish massive amounts of networking uh, data, uh, mostly traffic volume information. Uh, the point is to have uh, line cards directly send out the data towards the collector. And for this, uh, we had a requirement to have a low performance impact, hence uh, the use of a, of a lightweight UDP-based protocol. This draft is to be used with Thomas, with the draft that Thomas is going to give an update on uh, later, which is the subscription to distributed notifications. Uh, next slide, please, Marish. So uh, first set of changes based on the comments we received uh, in the last month. Uh, we renamed, uh, for obvious reason, the fragmentation option into segmentation option because that's basically what we do. Uh, in order to be consistent with uh, the netconf distributed notif draft, uh, I changed the generator ID term into observation domain ID. Then. Uh, we reworked the applicability section part of the draft to align with the RFC 8085 on UDP usage guidelines. Mostly what we covered is uh, congestion control or lack thereof, uh, dealing with MTU and the lack of reliability of the draft. Basically what we did is to show that uh, the context in which this protocol would, need, would be deployed uh, uh, is aligned with the recommendations that are proposed, that are uh, defined in the RFC. Uh, so I did not list all the strict recommendations and guidelines of the RFC, but I I have been sticking to the actual guidelines for the context of application of this protocol. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, we proposed some changes to uh, the notification message header. So what you can see first is that we stole a bit from the version field uh, to uh, introduce what we called an encoding space uh, flag. When it is unset, it means that the encoding type field is standard, meaning that what you the value that is in there is defining an encoding that is standard. And when this flag is set, it means that we are uh, falling into private encoding type space. What we mean by private is, for example, GPB, that is not a standard. And what would go there is any encoding type that a vendor would support that, it, that is not uh, a standard and that it, the vendor would decide on its own which encoding type it would decide to use. Uh, I agree that relying on the vendor documentation to uh, figure out what your uh, favorite vendor is sending to you would feel a bit archaic. So we have been having discussion on whether we would need a uh, netconf to be able to retrieve a description on what uh, the vendor is using as an encoding type. This is open for discussion. Me personally, I don't care too much about non-standard encoding types, so I'm really, really open uh, to that discussion. Uh, another comment that I received on the header was uh, we, uh, some people were challenging the need to put the observation domain ID and the message ID in the header itself by making the actually correct comment that those fields could be found in the payload. Alors, the main one critical reason to do that is that I would like to not uh, have the big data people that are further downstream uh, the communication channel to have to deal with segmentation. So I would like to be able to reassemble uh, messages that have been segmented before passing them further down the line towards big data. And so in order to do that, as the segmentation option 
is defined within the scope of a given message received by a given uh, generator, I need those two fields in order to uh, do a consistent job there. So that's the main reason. Other re another reason is quality of life. When I have those fields up there, I can uh, easily do load balancing based on and uh, by preserving consistency on the generator uh, that uh, is being done. So I can do load balancing based on the on the generator, and that eases distributed uh, uses of the co of the collector. Uh, I received another comment on the fact that uh, we currently use version zero. Uh, and that we should use version one so that we make sure that the vendor is actually, the producer of those messages is actually setting the, that field. I'm fine with that. I, I mean, for, to me, it does not change much, to be honest. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to keep it to zero until uh, the header has, uh, has converged to a stable state. So I would suggest that we do that on the version of the draft just before working group last call. If you have strong opinion on that, I'm okay to change it, uh, no problem. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion on how to deal with this private space. So I already said that uh, we can either rely on vendor documentation or uh, write a netconf draft to uh, retrieve that information. Uh, I, I would like you to discuss this and, and honestly, uh, we'll follow. <laughs> we'll follow the decision on the working group. I will not fight against any decision that you guys would make on this. Um, sure, Kent, if you want to go ahead. Just Kent as a contributor. Regarding the version being zero, um, I do recommend it. Uh, I'd recommend that. In fact, there is a separate RFC. I don't know the number offhand, but uh, there's a uh, IETF recommendation that any enumerated field, uh, both the zero and the max bit values, are reserved values. Um, and so, yes, both zero as well as, uh, I guess, seven. The value seven should be reserve fields uh, values for us, if possible. Okay, so okay, so what I will do, I will put it to one right away, or else I'm not complying. And so, and uh, for testing re purposes, etc., I will use zero internally, but I will put it to one uh, in the draft. Okay, does does that work for you? And I see Mahesh is in the queue. Go ahead, Mahesh. All right, so um, thank, uh, actually, Ken asked one of the questions I was going to ask uh, or suggest what he suggested. Um, the question on the private spaces, um, obviously, with the discussion around how you're going to learn of the encoding uh, that is being, uh, is there a negotiation mechanism that you would have then to find out what encoding is being supported? even if it is a vendor specific no what i was trying to to say is that if you want we can define one okay i'm okay to to provide a draft a companion draft to do that okay personally i i don't care really about non-standard encoding but uh, if if that's needed if we consider here as a working group that uh, uh basic archaic vendor documentation would not work, then we'll do the work of providing this mechanism. Okay. So yeah. if you want to poll the working group on how they want to deal with that, I'm fine with that. Currently, the uh, people I'm interacting with care about the standard ones mostly, right? And so this was the reason why we made this change was to deal with the fact that GPB is not uh, will be supported by vendors and is not standard, and so it was feeling weird to have it be uh, listed in the draft and given a, a code point in the standard encoding field, and so that was our way of dealing with that. If you want to change this, I'm also open to this. We had also, for example, a suggestion to uh, to have uh, to not use a space flag, but to reserve the last values of the encoding type field and uh, and let vendors use the reserve space i wanted to make things more uh, clear you know you see and so and not have to use reserve non documented uh, bits and so I, I it was i did that for clarity reasons if 
you want me to roll this back, I'm fine with this. I just would like to know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Thomas, you're next. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I just want to raise that this is a general problem. Uh, do we need to care about uh, private uh, space or not? If yes, then uh, both transport protocols, HTTP, as notif and UDP notif should support it. Uh, otherwise, if the working group thinks that this needs not to be supported, then I think it can be removed uh, on this draft. All right. Um, Andy? Uh, hi. I, I would prefer to take that SBIT out and, and put a GPB back back in the standard enumeration. I don't I don't know. I think that's an easier problem to solve than than all the complexity being added to discru discover proprietary encodings and everything. I agree with you completely. If in three months no one tells me that GPB is not standard and so it should not be there. You see my point? <laughs> because or else we're going to start working in circle. You, you see where I am there? <laughs> but I agree with you, Andy. I completely agree with you. I just cared about what's going to happen in three months. <laughs> well, I don't know uh, what, you know, AD reviews and other later reviews are going to produce as, as objections, but um, I don't know if there's a problem with with how it be uh, referenced or, or something like that, if it's a documentation problem or not. Mm -hmm. So if that's I... is, then, then hopefully uh, you just put the enumeration back and it'll be simpler for people to work with it. Mm -hmm. My original question was just that the, 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 there was no really reference uh, given document not that it shouldn't be there yeah but if i give, give a reference it will have to be an informative one and so the prop i will give one if we put it back there but it's going to be informative and so it's going to be the same comments further down the standardization line i'm afraid uh, okay well i still think the aspect should be taken out <laughs> <laughs> i don't mind i really don't mind <laughs> well actually you might be right that if we take it out and 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 use the approach where we reserve some values uh, that would be used for private use, there would not be any reference to non-standard encoding. But then I'm afraid that the question the question will once again be raised: How, how does an operator realize in a multi-vendor context and multi-release uh, context uh, which, which box is sending what? I mean, right? This is the main problem with non-standard stuff. So right, so, and and. I also, following the lines of Thomas' comments, I, uh, I hope we will be consistent with other transport mechanisms that are being used for uh, and that which face the same problem as well. Okay. Well. I would really have to like to have Robert's opinion on this actually as an AD. Okay. Rob, you're next. Um, I. I wasn't necessarily going to give an opinion as an AD on this. Um, I think potentially some further discussion. I, I had a question really as an individual that is, is, is saying GPB um, sufficient enough in terms of knowing what that encoding actually would be? Because I assume that with Yang, there's, there's a couple of different ways that you can code this data in Yang. You can either have a generic GPB encoding of Yang data, or in some cases, I thought some people use specific generated uh, GPP uh, models generated from the gang data. So is there a, an issue there that the GPP is, is not the, the issue about whether the encoding is known or not, but actually what will that data look like? Um, and maybe that could be solved by being more specific about exactly what the encoding is. But I, I, I do worry about having something that says it's done in this way, but it's unspecified. Yeah, the, the, um, I completely agree with you. The good thing is that for this draft, it does not matter because I would like to answer with not my problem answer, because to me, 
I'm packing messages that I, I'm reassembling messages when they are split at the transport layer with this draft, and then I'm passing it down towards the big data people, which know when they register, when they use a distributed uh, subscription uh, to, con to connect to the box, which deal at that, at, on that side on how they are going to do that. So, Tobas, you may want to, to, to agree with me or not on this uh, point. Yeah, uh, what I just wanted to, to mention here, yeah, and of course I agree here, uh, is maybe another option could be to have in the standard space, uh, have a fourth option where we just say other. Uh, that might solve the problem as well. Or then, yeah, uh, the question is, uh, and we need, I think, feedback from AD here is, if you can have like uh, in, in this area, like where we just do GPB or uh, any, we can list any non-standard encoding there. And in the end, it's up to the network operator to, to figure out how to, to decode those mess messages. All right, Kent. As a contributor, I just uh, there was a comment made about the uh, HTTPS notice draft. Uh, it, it it would also need to support private um, encoding if this were necessary. And I just wanted to state that I believe that's already the case in two ways. Um, first, if uh, if if. Uh, there's using HTTP media types, and it does, you know, define us, uh, or I should say, use the standard media types for um, JSON encoded Yang data and XML encoded Yang data. And but of course, it could, you know, private media types could be generated and created and used. And then secondly, for those uh, for when subscribe notifications are being used and and they're being configured. For configured subscribe notifications, there is a Yang identity called uh, encoding, I think. And uh, currently, there's sub identities for JSON and XML, but of course, um, private or other standard identities, sub identities could be defined as well. So I think I think it's already supported there, uh, if if uh, to to encode private um, encodings for HTTP for notifications for HTTP as native. All right. Uh, we should. Okay. I, th I think it. We may want to have another, may probably offline another round on discussion on this. Yeah, if you don't mind. But here, why don't you finish your presentation? You have two minutes. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Okay, I thought so. I saw Rob and Keith for a second, and Mahesh, we do. We're running ahead of schedule, I think. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, last last update, uh, we shrunk the segment number space to 16 bits because we were not needing 32, and then uh, I tried to bring more clarity on boxes that would rely on IP fragmentation instead of uh, supporting the segmentation option. Uh, I would like to. I will further. I will uh, simplify this even more and basically do like the IP fix and say uh, we should not do fragmentation. Uh, I was just wanting to try and not do, allow this. So say you can do this, but not by default. Uh, based on what we discovered last week uh, during the hackathon, etc., uh, I would like to change this and, and simply say you should not do fragmentation. Uh, then I received a bunch of comments on the relationship between the last bit flag of this option and the sequence number, uh, mostly by Andy. I agree with all of them, and the request for clarification will be done. So uh, you, had, uh, you were asking for details, and I agree with you. It, it was unclear on some parts, and and the changes you were asking, I agree with all of them. So it will you will find them in, in Dash 2. Next slide, please. Next. You can go to next slide, Mahesh. 
Uh, okay, so the current uh, implementation status is, uh, so during the hackathon, we were working in an environment where it, within Swisscom Lab, we had a Huawei implementation of this version. Uh, so we were following Dash01. Uh, based on the feedback that I will receive, I will update to the comment. And on the collector uh, slide side, we have a Golang version of the collector and a C version of the collector uh the c version is being uh, validated and integrated within uh, pmhgt right now for our next steps uh we will probably provide a ddls support for this uh, it's not our top priority because in all the deployment scenarios we we won't need it and uh, then i will uh, uh, apply the changes that you guys recommend based on the on the discussions on the mailing list that we will have based on this meeting thanks <laughs> All right, any questions? I don't see anyone in the queue. And anyway, we are also. Awesome. Well, Rob was in the queue before, and while I'm doing slide transitions, maybe he can come back and if he still has something to say. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Uh, yes, uh, it's actually on the previous issue, if we still have time. I'm, I'm not sure whether we need to discuss it further now. I think it needs further discussion on the list um, and, and, a, and a potential will get resolved during working group last call. I think the question was really about whether the ICG would accept a protocol where this is unspecified. And the answer is I don't know. I think it will just depend on the AD reviews at the time um, or the ICG reviews when that happens, from my point of view, I don't think it makes sense to make this overly complicated, that as long as we can communicate the intent sufficiently enough, that's that's probably good enough. But I, I need to look at the issue a bit more closely again uh, to actually give a definitive answer. Does that help? So, yes, that helps a lot. So what I would suggest is I remove the SBIT and I reserve uh, the last few values of, on them so that I don't need uh, any reference to anything and I and I and we proceed this way and so that I don't and I follow and this comment that this stuff is too complicated for no reason do I do that in the show too so, so just to understand are you saying that you wouldn't then have a GPP encoding with it? you would I would not, but I would reserve uh, values in the, I would not create a private space, but I would just reserve values. And uh, if we, and so that the, the header will no longer change. And if based on the review, we can leave a reference to a value being GPB, then we just leave it there. And that will just be a value being uh, fixed. Okay. And if they say GPB won't, won't work because it's not standard, then I leave it in the reserved space. That is the usual blurry space that, uh, that we define at the ATF for this reason. So I don't overcomplicate stuff with this S bit. I leave room for GPB in the standard space. If we get review uh, further down uh, the IESG review uh, that says, but GPB is not a standard, you can put, you cannot put it there. Then I will leave GPB being used in the reserved space that I will, uh, that I would define. I, so I don't think it matters whether GPB is a standard. I don't think that unless there'll be a problem um, okay. from that perspective. I think it's just a matter of whether it, the, the specification is clear or not in terms of what it's used. And it, it may be that effectively, if these are reserved, you can have some in a space that actually defines what these fields are for the ones that aren't, that aren't in the document. And hence, that can be extended with future documents that specify this behavior if required. Excellent. OK, cool. So uh, we will do, we will do that. I like this. Mm. OK. So the next presentation is actually draft ITF.com distributed in order to not unite. It's a adopted draft. Exactly. I'm sorry for that. So next slide, please. So in uh, compared to uh, zero zero, uh, these are the changes we made in the, the draft, mainly in two areas in the terminologies and uh, motivation part. In the terminologies, uh, we are basically borrowing uh, the terms from RFC 7011, so IPFIX export in section two and three dot one, uh, basically using the terms observation domain and observation domain ID, and consequently uh, replacing the term generator ID uh, with observation domain ID in the drafts, uh, distributed notif, UDP notif, 
and notification messages. In, uh, in the motiv motivation section, as requested from the, the, the working group mailing list, uh, we were specifying uh, the reasoning for uh, observation domain ID, mainly on uh, on the on the data integrity side to preserve it across uh, multiple publisher uh, export processes. Uh, the same also for being able to uh, recognize lost and corrupt young notification messages across multiple uh, export publisher processes. Next slide, please. So uh, the questions from the mailing list, which has not been resolved yet, are listed here, mainly from uh, Andy and Mahesh. Thank you very much. So one uh, question uh, was in regards whether we should map observation domain ID uh, exactly down to, to, to the, process, the processor publisher export process uh, by mapping to uh, ITF hardware, IANA hardware, uh, young models. By looking up IANA hardware, young models, the closest match I saw uh, was CPU, but it's unclear what CPU actually means, if it's uh, actually also matching the term network processors as well. And here, I like to get more feedback from the working group and also from the authors of ITF hardware, IANA hardware, wherever this is really the right place to, to augment to, uh, because uh, uh, if we want to map to the export process or just to the to the to the, the network processor to the CPU uh, only. So that's one question. The, the second one is in regards to the observation domain ID. Uh, if it's needed in the, the UDP notif header. And I think Pierre already uh, answered the question in his previous presentation. And I just wanna re-emphasize here that basically on the data collection side, if the observation domain ID would not be within the UDP notif header, uh, basically we, uh, in order to, to enable data integrity, we would need to look into the notification message itself. And I think that would be a cross-layer violation, which we would like to avoid. Uh, yeah, looking forward for feedback from the, the group. That's all. Any questions? Interrupt. So th this is a comment as an individual, and I have to say I've not read the specifics here. Um, but I would, I would, I think I would probably regard a CPU and NPU as generally being different um, in most cases. Often, sometimes they could be the same, but it might be useful to have um, separate term to differentiate them. The only other question I have, and again, I might be completely off mark here is if it's the observation domain ids are tied to what that is obviously some line cards may have multiple separate mpus so i don't know if that's something that needs to be considered or not or whether that is not an issue exactly so uh, as you nicely pointed out it's not only about the naming it's then also about uh, being able to to model it down to uh chassis line cards npus and down that road yeah Absolutely. All right, I'll put myself in the queue and ask. I, if, if I understand, I think Andy's question was, how would you identify, uh, and I don't want to speak for him, he can certainly speak uh, also, but uh, how do you identify a line card that has either been unplugged and put back in uh, versus it's been replaced by another line card with exactly the same type, how would you be able to distinguish between those two line cards? Right. 
uh, that's only possible if you start to 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 model observation domain ID in, in a in a Yang model, uh, and for and currently I uh, neither ITF hardware nor IANA hardware is supporting this. That's why I'm asking for uh, feedback from the working group and uh, the authors how you intend or what you think is the best way to model this, because once uh, we we have a feedback on on this. We can help here to to and extend augment uh, the Yang model and then basically merge the observation domain ID in there. The moment it's not existing. So would you say then that you have a problem today, irrespective of whether ITF hardware is the right Yang model, that you need a way to uniquely identify a line card? Exactly. If if that is the intent, if that is what we are uh, aiming for, then absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, in in IPFIX, they did not so resolve that problem. Uh, so there, the the, the IDs were, were gener generated, and you could not map it down to the to the line card to the the, the network processors, and it was already sufficient. Uh, to to ensure data integrity, so for the data collection, uh, it's not needed to to map down to the to specific uh, network processor. But it uh, in in order to troubleshoot further, it certainly helps. And I'm not against it. I'm I'm fully supporting that idea. Okay. Right, any other questions? If not, we can ready. We are ready to move to, I guess, the non-chartered items. And Ping, are you there? Can you queue up? All right. You're good to go, right? OK, OK. Um, hello, uh, this is Peng Liu from China Mobile. And it's about the telemetry data export capability. So next slide, please. OK, let's have a recap first. Um, the motivation is that the notification mode divide in that kind of notification capabilities allows a client to discover a set of capabilities, um, such as transport independent session level, um, and support by the server. And, but some transport specific parameters are lacked, um, just like the transport protocol encoding format and the encryption. Um, so the goals. Um, of the work is to augment system capabilities model and provide additional data export attributes for uh, transport in independent capability negotiation. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, okay, this draft uh, was first presented uh, in the um, last ITM meeting and it was suggest to set up design team to process this work and the latest update of the draft is version 2 and the change um, a three um, points first is we remove the uh, max node per sensor group and uh, max sensor group per update in uh, YAM model because um, um, there are maybe uh, some vendors don't have uh, don't need to have these characters. And we also remove the subscription mode. Um, and beca uh, because we think that we uh, can add some specific um, functions or parameters, and we don't use this um, subscription mode, and it can be uh, more simple and, and uh, simple, yeah. And the third one is we um, add adaptive interval support and remove sampling interval uh, list definition. 
um, to support the adaptive interval um, collection, uh, which will be introduced in, uh, later, yes. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Peng, you're a little bit quiet on the microphone. If you're able to um, in improve that, that'd be good. Okay. Um, okay, um, this is an overview of um, the data export capability model. Um, the server, it shows that the server notifies the telemetry data export capability to the data collector, and which could be the network management system. It notifies the uh, transport protocol encoding format and uh, uh, secu security uh, protocol. Yeah. And then the NMS can uh, uh, subscribe the young notification according to its demand. And for example, it needs the ODP protocol binary encoding format and uh, the uh, uh, security protocol. Then the server will send the notification over UDP and uh, also satisfy other parameters or functions. Um, it just shows the protocols are needed. In fact, the server will notify all the capability to the um, network management system. Yeah, and here are two pictures show the um, version. Okay, maybe I guess it's not the latest version. Uh, it's no problem. Yeah. Um, next page, please. Okay, here are some issues uh, which are discussed in the mailing list, I think, and uh, and both of the three questions are solved. Um, the first question is the server can provide a hint based on the exact request from the client. Um, so we just to reply that the answer is one of the principles set by RFC um, uh, young push is um, to minimize the number of subscription iterations between um, subscriber and the publisher and discourage random guessing of different parameters by a, a subscriber. And our idea is to try to prevent the problem at the stage of negotiation of uh, subscri subscription in order to minimize the number of um, iterations. Yeah. So we want to just uh, maybe it can improve the efficiency and uh, uh, increase the uh, load rate. Yeah. And the second question is about the static per node mo monitoring data can be quite large. Um, so we just discussed about it and uh, we think the subscriber applications need a way to identify capabilities for some data store node object. And uh, um, in fact, we can't assume that all data objects defined in the YAML model support threshold handling. And maybe just some of the uh, support these functions and uh, um, so it won't um, generate so many um, data. Yeah, and the uh, um, third, third question is sensor group um, seems a very vendor specific capability. So we remove the two um, parameters and why is max node per sensor group and uh, um, max sensor group uh, per update. And uh, and we uh, we have taken them out in the latest version. Yeah, um, th these three questions are the three main questions discussed in the mailing list. So I think um, all of them are solved uh, now. Yeah. Mm, okay. Next slide, please. So it's about the um, data export capability. And can we call uh, adoption of it as a work item? And any comments? So as this is kind of as co-chair, uh, this is one of the documents that was we did the adoption suitability poll for before. Yeah. And um, yeah. Well, I, and there was an objection that was raised, I think, by Andy. I just want to be, uh, was that covered? How, how did that objection get resolved? Okay, okay so sorry, I, I just missed uh, some of the voice. 
Sorry, I didn't understand the response. Can you say that again? Okay. Um, I asked the question on Kemp's behalf. What he's asking is, did we resolve the objection that was raised during the adoption poll of the draft? Uh, okay, I think, uh, Jane, can you ask, answer this question? Chen, why don't you go next? Chen, do you want to step up to the mic to answer the question? Okay, you. Okay, oh, go ahead. Chen. Hello? Yeah, Chen? Oh, okay, this is Chen, actually. Yeah, as uh, uh, Peng Liu actually clarified, we discussed uh, the issue. We, we list uh, in the uh, uh, last slides, actually, all, all the issue has already resolved in the latest uh, version. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we, so all the changes we, we made, actually, has, has already incorporated in, in the, the version 0.2. Okay, so go ahead, Ken. Uh, my comments are something else, so I'll let Andy go first on this. Actually, I've got a comment about the structure of the draft or content of the draft. All right, go ahead, Andy. Well, I just don't think this all this extra complexity is needed, and that the RPCs already have extensive mechanisms to provide these hints and. And ignoring that and doing something else isn't isn't that high a priority. Yeah, uh, Andy. Uh, actually, we clarify your uh, issue actually in the first bullet. Actually, I I think um uh, we 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 did send an update slide. Actually, you know, you we did a could use the RPC and use the error option to show uh, what what what's uh, what's uh, wrong actually, but the. Uh, if we define this uh, capability in advertisement, actually we can avoid, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary uh, negotiation. You know, uh, so th so that's the way. You know, we we, we reference uh, some of text in uh, Young Push. Actually, you know, it also you know uh, highlight that you know we should avoid the, you know uh, unnecessary sub subscription exchange iteration. Yeah, so this I, is I, how we how we address your comments. Yeah. I don't see where that's happening because uh, either I send one request and I get back the hints, or I send the request your way and I get back the capabilities. Either way, it's one request, one response. I don't see all the extra work iterations that you're talking about. Yeah, well, our idea is in the first step we, you know, to just advertise uh, the capability to to the server, so server can to choose, for example, choose uh, what a transport protocol it, it will use in 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 the young push subscription message. Uh, so you don't need to you know uh, to to uh, have the this RPC to yeah. Yeah, can we suggest that you take this discussion? We are uh, running a little behind, and we still have Rob in the queue. So can you take okay, the okay. discussion of iterations and RPCs to the queue, please? The mailing okay, list. We can take, take it to the list, yeah, sure. Bro? Uh, so just one, one quick comment on that is, I, th I think what this draft is providing is to allow the capabilities to be expressed up front, as in maybe in an instance data document. So um, a client could be uh, coded to design time to know what the capabilities of the servers like to be. So, so that's one comment. So that's, but the other question I had was in terms of the structure of the Yang, it looked like you could just define 
for example, one transport that supported or one encoding, um, whereas I'd have thought that, that servers have different capabilities that they support, and hence um, it may be that the structure of the model needs to be more flexible, or otherwise I don't, I don't understand in the Yang why it, it's only expressing one of those rather than this is the set of different transports or encodings that are supported. Yeah, I, I think we can allow the server to advertise the capability, for example, support different transport protocol, but uh, we can make a client to make a choice which uh, transport protocol or encoding they can support. Uh, okay, we really need to move on to the next presentation. I think, Chen, you're up next. Yeah, can you open slides? Yeah, we're coming up. Do a few seconds. <laughs> There's like five confirmation windows you have to click through in order to get to them. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this is Qingwu. I'm here to uh, discuss ad adaptive subscription to Young Notification Draft Update. And uh, next. So uh, current status of this draft has been presented in previous two ITA meeting. And uh, actually, we uh, tried in a, in a previous ITA meeting, it was suggested to align with ESA model. And also, we actually introduce a new uh, subscription mode uh, besides uh, uh, the periodic subscription and uh, uh, unchanged subscription. And uh, so we need to better characterize this uh, subscription. Uh, so in uh, last night meeting, we also you know, discussed this and uh, uh, we got uh, actually <laughs> a lot of support. And uh, so in, in latest version, actually, uh, we uh, try to, you know, uh, remove the dependency to the ESA model. We, we remove the data pass target definition. And uh, we also, you know, clarify uh, the X pass external uh, evaluation node in the young model and uh, and the rewrite the usage example to align with these young model parameter changes. Next. So for people who don't know what the adaptive subscription is, actually, it is the extension uh, to the subscription uh, notification. For young push subscription, they support two uh, different modes. One is the period subscription, which allow you to publish the data periodically. And uh, another is unchanged subscription, which allow you to uh, publish data when, when data get changed or protocol operation on data get changed. But in some cases, uh, uh, maybe uh, for server and client, they both they may support multiple, you know, uh, period intervals. So the server may need to switch uh, different interval according to the network condition or research usage. The typical example is the wireless performance monitoring. The wireless signal strength can be weak, can be strong. So uh, because of the air interface uh, resources, it's very, it's very expensive. So we can, uh, when the wireless signal strength is very strong, we actually can uh, collect the data at a lower rate, but when the signal strength uh, is very uh, weak, actually, we can collect more data since uh, we need to have uh, sufficient uh, enough data uh, to do the troubleshooting. So this can uh, 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 greatly reduce the, the data to export to the client. So he, uh, so we introduce this uh, subscription, uh, uh, adaptive subscription, and uh, enable this uh, subscription to uh, the publish event, and uh, so they can adjust the volume, uh, the telemetry traffic. Next. So this is uh, uh, what the model structure look like. So actually, we augment the subscriber notification. Uh, we propose a set of parameter, for example, periodic, uh, anchor time, and uh, this uh, will specify new duration for push up data, and uh, this. Uh, period will be triggered when uh, condition get changed. And then the anchor time will specify the starting point for each uh, updated uh, uh, interval. 
uh, at the same time uh, update the interval. And uh, also we uh, introduce uh, what uh, water marker and uh, uh, and X pass external evaluation. This actually can uh, provide the evaluation uh, creation and uh, the watermark uh, actually is a part of this uh, uh, evaluation expression and uh, can uh, use to uh, to ex uh, to to express the condition uh, to be sat satisfied and and trigger the uh, interval switching. So here we we just give an example. So when uh, uh, such condition uh, expressed by, expressed by the XPath external evaluation uh, uh, actually uh, get changed. Actually, it, uh, it, uh, the, the condition uh, get uh, uh, actually uh, uh, satisfied. Actually, it will uh, send the, the adaptive uh, periodic update notification immediately, and uh, so the client can adjust the uh, uh, the, the the telemetry. Uh, uh, connection rate uh, accordingly. Next. Uh, here is the issue we actually uh, uh, raised by the ND on the list and uh, about the filter. It's uh, uh, this filter and the trigger maybe not uh, in good design. Uh, so we uh, make a, uh, uh, some change actually accordingly. Uh, for example, we, we take out the data pass target and think that we, we don't think that this is uh, something needed uh, because this actually will uh, impact or influence uh, the uh, event record uh, uh, output actually. So in uh, this model, we, we also uh, change the naming. For example, we change the condition expression to the XPath external expression. This uh, XPath uh, external expression will keep track of uh, data object change, but uh, this uh, expression will not, uh, you know, uh, affect uh, the uh, event record output uh, and uh, the only uh, can use to trigger the interval uh, switching in the server. Um, that, that's the main change we, we made actually try to simplify this, this model and uh, decouple from the EC, EC model since we think of these different use cases uh, doesn't need to be tied with the EC uh, use cases. and. Uh, uh, next. This is the main change, and also it was the one that um, the reason why the adoption poll did not succeed. Um, I don't recall it being discussed in the list, but uh, maybe Andy, since it was your objection, if you've had a chance to take a look at this, can you can you speak to it as if uh, as to whether or not it resolves your issue? Go ahead, Andy. I haven't read the latest draft and uh, don't really have any objections. Uh, you know, it's uh, not really our focus right now with Yang Push. We've actually spent a lot of work implementing Yang Push and <clears throat> and decided that the periodic stuff isn't isn't that great. So on change is is what you want to use and 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 it's just much more efficient. And trying to, uh, you know, adjust the period on the fly. <clears throat> it's more work to do on change, but it's better. So, yeah. Thanks, Andy. So, uh, as a contributor, um, Andy, I'm kind of curious about that comment that you just made because I think the the reason for the periodic was because. Um, there's some values that just don't change very often at all, uh, maybe even once a day or even less often. But uh, because they're periodically pushed in case the uh, subscriber comes in later, um, they get it, um, you know, the value. But I guess there's also a sync up that occurs, right? So when they first, when the subscriber first, there's a sync, sync up, so they get all the values up front. And then, um, and then I guess it's just changed from that point forward. Okay, so okay, maybe I do understand. I'm answering my own question. Yeah, and you can you can request a resync on the fly too. So if you okay. if you miss that, you know, or lost it. Okay, thank you, uh, Robert. You're in the queue. Uh, so just a comment to the individual. So I just again wonder whether this is quite a complex solution um, to the problem, and whether a simpler solution might just be to mark 
some subscriptions as being effectively higher priority data and others as lower priority. And then uh, to, to have one setting to say, allow this to be uh, adaptive in some way, and then just leave it to the device to try and reduce the rate that it's, it's sending this information out if necessary, without specifying specific periods or paths or that sort of thing. So to so have it as a more course level uh, type of QoS rather than having to specify specific conditions and things like that. So you put more intelligence into the device, you're relying on it to do sensible things rather than giving you very specific instructions as to how to manage this data. But it's just as an individual comment. Uh, Robert, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, uh, for your proposal, it seems you need to set, set, uh, uh, satisfy actually to lose some of data since you priority some of the data. But uh, for our cases, uh, we whether you use uh, the uh, high uh, data connection rate or lower data, uh, data connection rate, you will not lose any data. Uh, Can you hear you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Great terms. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Robert's comment. Uh, I was thinking the same. So uh, I think ideally, if uh, for a periodical subscription, we could have a range, say from from one to ten, and then basically the the the, uh, the, 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 the publisher decides, depending on on the state, uh, which which value it's choosing for the the export interval. Yeah, the, the assumption we made is uh, you can support a multiple uh, updated interval, but a server they may have uh, the capability to to switch this interval to you know reduce uh, uh, you know the volume of the data to be export uh, to to the client to so you can you know address this performance uh, uh, bottleneck. Uh, so uh, yeah, that that's what we proposed. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we are running behind, so maybe um, take it to the mailing list again. Right, uh, so Chin, I would suggest that, uh, you know, uh, take uh, the discussion to the mailing list, including the question of adoption. Let's try okay. to resolve on the mailing list, please. OK, thank you. All right, next we have Yan. Very good. Go ahead. We can. Very good. So next slide, please. And next. So uh, now that we have NetConf being spread around uh, and, and managers are actually starting to use this a lot, one of the use cases I see very often is that the manager wants to keep in sync with the configuration changes on a large set of devices. So you often see that, okay, it's doing a get config initially to see what the configuration on that device is and get to reply. And then after some time, longer or shorter, it's interested to make a change. And before it makes a change, it likes to see, is this configuration still the same? It issues another get config and eventually gets a reply and sees that, oh yeah, it's the same. But this mechanism is uh, it's quite wasteful because it's uh, getting this get config reply, which is oftentimes exactly the same as the get config reply earlier. And it is pretty large in many cases. So if there was a, shorter and easier way to get to know if this configuration is the same or not. That would be very convenient. Uh, I have seen actually several vendors have implemented their own proprietary mechanisms for providing a shorter way to convey this information like a timestamp of last change or some checksum of the config or something that you can read in order to see if anything has changed at all in the device. But those mechanisms, we, we are using them and they are kind of nice, they're better than nothing, but uh, they are not quite good enough because in, in many cases there have been small changes somewhere, but maybe not in the area where 
this particular client is interested to see, oh, has it changed? So it will be reported as changed, but it hasn't changed in anything, in any area that this client is caring about. So we are back to square one, essentially. Uh, if you go to the next slide. This mechanism also has the problem that uh, it often, often gives, or sometimes gives false, false uh, alarms. Or, or you miss it false. Uh, you say that you notice that, oh, I issue a get config, and you get a get config reply. You spend a lot of CPU time to compute, is this the same as, as last time? Yeah, and it is. But in the meantime, there's a window of opportunity for another client to come in and make a change. So we think it is still the same, but actually it has changed since uh, somebody got in, in the middle. So then we get into the case where we are updating the server in an unsynchronized manner, even though it's, we'll check. So I'm proposing a mechanism to get away from both of these problems, make it more efficient and make it more reliable. Next, please. Contributor, I think with yeah. NetConf, it's traditional for uh, lock, followed by get config, followed by uh, edit config. So you're ensured that you're um, only editing the data that you had gotten inside the lock. Can you speak to that? That would take a long time then, because getting the config and computing if there's a change uh, can take several minutes. So then you would have to lock for a long time. And I think that's not what we see happening in real networks. OK, thanks. OK, so I'm proposing a solution uh, where we say that uh, we have a concept of a transaction ID attribute that you that the server may report for every container and list elements. So we don't want to have this on every leaf and everywhere, but on containers and list elements. And uh, we make sure that uh, whenever uh, there's an edit config, the server will update the transaction the ID value for every container and list element that have been touched by this transaction, so that a client can rely on this transaction ID being something new. If, if it has changed, if something inside it has changed. And the client may optionally specify a transaction ID value that they would like the server to use. Uh, so anything that is touched by this client, or so uh, it can, the, in an edit config, the client can uh, specify this transaction ID, uh, and then the server will apply that transaction ID value to everything that has been touched. But also the client during a get config can specify transaction IDs of what it expects to say, oh, I believe the contents of this container or this list element has this transaction ID. And if it matches, uh, there's no need for the server to send the content of that. And on the next slide, please, uh, I have an example of what that looks like. So here we have an initial sync where the client is issuing a get config and uh, with a filter to, for interfaces and NACM. And on the interfaces, it says, uh, hey, can I have the transaction IDs for this, please, by issuing this in tag equals question mark. Next, please. And uh, this is what the reply might look like. So here the server has uh, decorated the reply with these transaction and tag uh, values. And you can see this dev something, dev something on various containers on the, well, you have the, on the top level here data, which is for the entire data store, saying that the, the global transaction ID for the data store is dev 888. Whereas for interfaces, the whole set of interfaces container, it's dev 888. And for a particular interface here, gigabit ethernet 00, it's dev 888. But uh, another interface, gigabit ethernet 01, has an older N tag called ABC123. So this is how the server would decorate the replies with these tags for the areas of the response where it was requested by the client earlier in the filter. Next, please. And then uh, later, uh, the client can say, OK, I do a get config here on interfaces with this n tag value ABC123, which is what I expect to be here. And next, please. This is how a server would reply, and it would say, 
yeah it has actually been some changes in, in interfaces so the, the the global transaction id is now def 88 interface is also def 88 this uh, gigabit ethernet 00 has also changed it's def 88 and here's a The one which had I think that was all my slides basically go let's take the next one yeah okay right uh, so in a edit config we could, uh, the client could also say, hey, I expect the, tr the transaction ID of this uh, interface to be GHI5555. Uh, so uh, if it is, go ahead uh, and run this transaction and delete this interface in this case. But if it isn't, if one of these transaction IDs uh, have a mismatch, then abort the whole transaction and report it uh, Things are not the way that you expected. Things things have moved since you last uh, synchronized. So then the transaction is supported. So that's a safe way of performing this edit. I think there was one more slide with just some. See, Tim Ferry, thank you. Tim, do you have a question or comment? Go ahead. I have a question, um, and it's really maybe. Uh, can you address the issue of, of the uh, the race condition where uh, you know you set a transaction ID of foo and uh, by the time you come back with the git config uh, elements that you have changed is ha have been changed uh, either by the system or, or or through other some other client is that is that the intention how do you handle the fact that your data set of what you thought you changed got changed between between the time you changed it and you got and you issued the get. Yeah, this is exactly the, the mechanism to handle that problem. So by uh, the client uh, proposing a transaction ID when it's making an edit config, or by this and certainly by the server guaranteeing that whatever something changes, a new transaction ID has to come on to this to the touched containers and list elements. That's how uh, a client can be sure that. Uh, only it can read updates only by using get config with these transaction IDs, and it can edit config safely by adding this transaction ID for what it expects, and only if all the tags that is mentioned in the edit config are matching, only then will the transaction go through. So that's a safety lock there. Yeah, but I as a client won't know. I don't have any assurance that what I have changed under this transaction ID is indeed what is still changed when I do like a get config right after I, I make my changes or, or I wait three seconds or three minutes, right? I mean, is that is that expected or is that a, a hole in the, uh, the concept, right? Um, no, but where, because you don't have any, uh, uh, with lock, everything's atomic, right? You know, everything's there and it's and it's atomic. With this, this is kind of it's not it's not a, it's it's not safe in terms of the uh, uh, the the transactional set, right? You know that you know that this is what's changed. Uh, uh, and what has changed? Which which elements? Which leaves have changed? Right? It is absolutely atomic. If any tags do not match, now the transaction is aborted entirely. I'm not giving up on transactionality. Oh, you're saying like on the delete and in the I was talking about just the original change with the get. I, I'm sorry, I was back on the previous slide when I when I entered the queue. So I come in, I do an edit config, right? I'm not doing a delete operation yet, right? I'm just trying to figure out what changed, right? So I do an edit config, I say tag foo, right? Uh -huh. And then I say, okay, git config. Uh, you know, and I want to get the, I want to understand which nodes were changed to foo, right? Based upon foo. But in between then, some other client can come in and make a change, right? And so it loses that tag. And so I, right. I never really understand there's, there's opportunity or there's chances there that I will never really understand uh, what actually changed, right? Particularly if it's a uh, quick changing uh, uh, set of nodes. 
or frequently changing set of nodes. I, I just, is that accurate? I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand if that's a problem. Right, I may not understand uh, your intent exactly here. So, I mean, if you're interested in knowing uh, the exact state of the device, uh, you're welcome to either do a get config of everything and, uh, or to do a subscription of some sort. You can do that to in, follow, in order to follow everything. But uh, what this is about is uh, to ensure that when a, when a client has a view of, uh, of the state of a server, it should be able to verify that view quickly by saying, okay, I, I know this about the, the configuration and these are the, the tags I'm aware of, and just report the differences versus what I know. So that's the mechanism I'm looking for here. Okay, that's so, so now I kind of understand it. You're just saying, hey, look, I, I made this modification and then I want to go back and do some editing, but only if I'm the last one that changed it, right? Okay, all right. Now yes, or, Thank you. yes, uh, yes. And uh, also the case that, okay, there may be changes, and if there are, let me know what those changes are versus what I know. So don't report everything everywhere. Uh, if, if things are as I expect them to be, then don't report them. Okay, sorry guys. Uh, I know I'm in the queue and the last is after me, but uh, we are really out of time on this, so. Sorry, Balaz, can you take your question to the mailing list? Um, actually, Mahesh, I, I'll give some time to Balaz. Okay. It's okay. All right, then my, maybe. My, my presentation is after this one for, for other people who are wondering where that's coming from. But, hey, go ahead, Balaz. Okay. What's your question? Uh, my point is that we have something very similar in RESTConf, and it would be good to understand that is this the same mechanism, actually, or are we if we have a data store that is uh, visible both on RESTConf and NETConf, then we, do we have to supply uh, support to similar but not the same mechanism? So describe somehow the relationship with uh, RESTConf ETAGs. Yes, this was definitely greatly inspired by the ETAGs. And my intention is that the server implementation should be able to be joined here. But things are still early in this draft, uh, and uh, we will see where it takes it. I don't want to uh, guarantee that it will be exactly the same or very much compatible with ETAGs. But yes, it is the same mechanism that we have in ETAGs already that I'm trying to describe here. But I know I, I'm on the queue, so uh, if it's okay, can can I take one more minute? I'll take that as a yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I I understand the optimization in terms of trying to tag at, at least at the container and the list node, but couldn't this be a little more close-grained for? Um, you just say for a given config or a transaction, you have a tag. And if you're trying to edit it and if the tag doesn't match, you request that you do it out. Uh, you request the client make another get config request before moving to, to try to make any edit changes. Meaning you don't have to necessarily carry tag at every container and list level. You could carry it at the transaction level. Yes, it's up to the client to decide where, it need, where, what part of the transaction it really cares about things being the same. It can say for this part of the tree, I'll just uh, go ahead as a traditional edit config. But for the interfaces list, I'm really interested to make sure that all the interfaces I touch are untouched, or that no interfaces have been touched, or a particular aspects of uh, details of one interface are important. So it's up to the client to decide where the tags have to match. Okay. Uh, so as chair, um, Mahesh, can you go ahead and bring up my, my pre the last presentation? Um, but as a contributor uh, to Jan, um, I would recommend trying to align this work exactly with RESTConf, uh, if possible, because I know that some you know servers that uh, present both RESTConf and NetConf actually build one of those interfaces on top of the other. Um, and I think typically RESTConf is built on top of NetConf. But um, anyway, if it, if it, 
I guess the question is why wouldn't why couldn't it be the line or aligned? Why wouldn't it be the aligned? It, what was the reasoning for not being aligned? I think uh, it, I'm taking it to the list, but please um, try to address that comment later. Certainly. All right, Mahesh, can you go full screen, please? Okay, so this is the last presentation. Um, as everyone probably saw on the list, there was some interest in introducing support for list pagination in both the NetConf and the RESTConf protocols. I sent out a, um, a call for participation and did get some respondents uh, responses. Uh, thank you, Jin, Olaf, and Hongwei. Uh, there are actually also other uh, respondents, but um, they haven't yet contributed, uh, and so they're not yet listed here. But hopefully that will improve next next presentation. Next slide, please. The motivation for this work is to first and foremost to better support user-facing client interfaces interacting with data from potentially large lists. Examples of potentially large lists include traffic logs, or really any time series data, which might include uh, audit log, but in general, um, those uh, time is kind of like config false uh, op state type data. Um, but also within configuration, there are some very large lists, uh, sometimes interfaces or firewall rule bases uh, can grow to be in the thousands. Um, and of course, it's all very manageable today with existing in the you know, NetConf. Uh, I mean, already it's the, uh, the client gets the entirety of the large configured list and then handles it uh, itself in its own memory. Um, but uh, if we are already solving the problem for the extremely large, potentially um, op-state list, uh, also you know, uh, transferring that to the config true lists would be of some benefit. And then uh, lastly, uh, server-side processing in general reduces latency and bandwidth and client resources. So that's the motivation behind this work. Next slide, please. The solution, <laughs> okay, the, I'm just looking at the graphics. Uh, no, it's not like the bottom line is all crossed out. It's supposed to be filter goes to sort, sort goes to direction, etc. You can see the little arrows, but it's, uh, it's not looking quite right. Anyway, I'll, let me go back up to the top of the slide. The solution proposal is to introduce uh, to both NetConf and RESTConf an API for list pagination. There's five control points that have been discussed, and this was uh, on the list, so I'm a bit repeating, but since this is the first presentation introducing the work, I wanted to make sure uh, there's a slide for it. Um, there's the ability to limit the number of results that are returned in the response. There's the ability to control the point at which the result set begins. You know, you, maybe you don't want to start always start at the very beginning of the list. You might want to begin somewhere in the middle. Uh, there's the direction uh, that the results are returned. Are they returned in the forward or reverse direction? And uh, potentially there's an ability to sort the results, maybe um, uh, on a particular node or in in a SQL terms on a column, you know, sort on a particular column, and then and then uh, the results would be in that order. Or uh, if it's an ordered by user list, by default the order is the order the the configured order, uh, as it were, by the ordered by user list. And then lastly, there's uh, potentially the ability to filter the items. Maybe uh, the client is only interested in and zooming in to a particular subset of the data. Um, <clears throat> now these control points are actually ordered in processing. There's a processing order. Uh, it is in fact a, the reverse order. So first the uh, results are filtered. Uh, filters in general are very fast. They're almost always, uh, well, uh, hopefully the node or the leaf that you're uh, filtering on has been indexed by your backend database. So it's a fairly, it's a pretty fast um, operation to do the filter. Uh, and then if there is a, a need to do sorts, that would happen after the filter. So you're only sorting the subset of the data that has uh, gotten through the filter, uh, if there were was a filter. 
then lastly the direction and and then um, and then you can choose whether or not you're going to skip or do an offset into that result set and then and then lastly you figure out what subset of the data or how many re number of the results that you're going to return so that is the processing order and um, for those that are familiar with SQL, that is exactly what SQL does. And I imagine um, it is the same for most backend databases, but that is in fact uh, what this uh, author list is, is uh, doing. So there's a number of authors that are, or, you know, some authors are more in implementation oriented. And so we have a representation of different backend databases and uh, we're doing prototypes to uh, of this of all this to ensure that it's mappable to the various backend databases. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is an, a mostly discussion. So I have questions to the group. There first, there's some protocol independent questions, and the first three are actually related. So I'm going to speak to I'm going to say them all, but then sort of go back and ask for comments on each one at a time. Uh, so first, uh, how important is it to iterate over stable result sets? Uh, I think it was Jan uh, who had posted a comment about this to the list, uh, but essentially should something like cursors or snapshots be supported? And uh, just sort of thinking out loud, I'm, I'm you know, for configured, for, for configure, for configuration, um, with RESTConf at least, and in, in, in the last presentation, the the uh, the equivalent of an e tag or timestamps, uh, you know, that is that good enough uh, in the sense that, um, you know, if you're doing a, a get on you know data, and and you're saying okay, I know the e tag is supposed to be this, or I know the timestamp is supposed to be this, and um, you know if it and you're you know indexing or you're paging into the the data set, but now the data set's been changed under under the under the hood. Um, you know, wouldn't it be good enough to just for the client to get back an error uh, saying, "Hey, you know, the data sets changed. You need to restart your pad your pagination," um, or is that not good enough? And you, we actually need to create uh, something like a cursor um, or a snapshot. Uh, so uh, that's for my my thinking out loud for configuration, and then thinking out loud for op state. Uh, for again, I'm assuming we're talking about read only time series data like um, audit log or traffic logs. And I'm, you know, I'm guessing it's stable enough. It's it's read only. I, I mean, sure, logs can expire. You know, given how much um, resources, memory, or or uh, you know, storage the the server has on board. But you know, you can imagine logs sticking around for you know at least a few hours or days or whatever. And um, I mean, they may the client may not get the the most recent set of logs, but the, you could imagine the pagination logic always. Having in it a um, a filter criteria saying that the timestamp has to be, uh, or I'm sorry, cannot be greater than whenever the pagination began. So all the uh, logs that came in after the pagination began would be excluded, and hence effectively the uh, remaining logs are. It is a stable data set. Um, again, uh, not including pur purging. Okay, so for number two and three, I'm, again, I'm going to mention these quickly and then go back to one. Uh, for two, I'm wondering if offset or skip. Um, I mean, those are we're trying to figure out what 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 the term what the name should be. Is it offset or skip? Um, then that's actually the comment for number three. But is the offset slash skip uh, parameter should it be an integral amount like an integer value, which should be consistent with um, SQL's limit, sorry, a SQL's offset parameter, or should it be a key-based lookup? So you, you begin your pagination and and then somehow the the last uh, entry of the result set you got back, you know, it contains a, a keyed value, and then your your subsequent request for the next page of data is actually by page, or I'm sorry, by key. You're asking for the next set of data beginning with a key as opposed to the next set of data um, indexed by an integer. And then for number three, uh, and it really is the question of, it's a naming question, Sh should it be um, called uh, skip or, or should it be called uh, count? Um, I think in least SQL it's count, 
and, or, and, and, then, and likewise should be called offset or, or limit. I'm sorry, I think I have this backwards. It's skip or offset, count or limit. I'm sorry, I, I don't have it. But anyway, the question is how aligned to SQL um, names should we be? Of course, if going to number two, if we're doing a key lookup, i.e. we're not going towards SQL or we're moving away from that approach, then the whole notion of whether or not we're aligned with SQL doesn't matter. Um, so that's why, or how it's three is related to two, and of course two is connected to one. So going back to one, um, and to the group, please, if anyone has any comments, uh, how important is it to iterate over a stable set of results? We only have five minutes, so if there's any urgent, urge, urgent comment, please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see anything coming. I'll take that to the list. Um, for number four, um, question is, should subsorts be supported? And currently the design as just, uh, presented on the previous screen was very much uh, just a single sort, you could, um, which is, you know, f by and large, 95% of what clients want, just a single sort. You, your email client, right? You can only s or do a single filter um, at a time. It, it's, that's very common. But um, it is noted that SQL supports subsorts. So for instance, you can do an order by foo ascending and then by bar descending, for instance. Um, so there's this question as to whether or not subsorts should be supported. I do see um, Balaj in the queue. Please, Balaj, go ahead. Early in Yang design, we avoided so sorting because for some data types, that's quite complex. Just as an idea that the O with the two dots, that letter, is in some alphabets behind the O, the simple O, some al alphabets is behind the Z car uh, character. Are you going to e uh, address these complexities of sorting or what do you want to do with them? Uh, that's an interesting comment. Um, I will take that to the list. Martin had strong opinions of that on that, I don't know, a few years ago. Okay, so I think Martin has been involved of some with this comment, uh, with the, the, the discussion on the list previously. And um, I mean, in general, the thinking is that we should be using XPath query language for this, and so whatever um, that it, it supports would be, by and large, what we'd be doing. Um, but I'll take this to the list. Do you have another question or comment, Balash? Um, thanks. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're still in the queue. I don't That's expect right. a full answer just now. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So next slide, please, Mahesh. All right, so uh, again, with the protocol independent or continuing with that, how many drafts should there be? So this one I'm really hoping to get a response from right now. Should there be one draft, um, i.e. that contains three parts, uh, uh, the general definition, net comp specifics, and then rest comp specifics? Uh, so the pros of this is that it's a nice package, it brings it all together. The cons is that it's not a great RFC target for future work. Or there could be two drafts. Uh, one for each uh, NetConf and, and RESTConf. Uh, pros is that we've then decoupled and now they, uh, they make better RFC targets for future work. Um, of course, you can imagine, you know, if a third protocol were to come along, it could then be its own draft, and so that's very nice. Um, but the cons is that there are some redundancies between the two. So, for instance, the uh, those five control points that we've talked about before, they would have to be defined individually each in those drafts. Um, and likewise, the examples, you can imagine an example module, an example data set, an example uh, data results that you would expect. Um, I mean, of course, we, wanted, we do want to illustrate the query language in you know, each of the protocol specific drafts, but we don't necessarily need to uh, redefine um, uh, the authoritative res you know, results set examples uh, in, in each. Um, and then, um, or, or three, option three, is to have three drafts, which you know again would be the uh, a general one draft would be general definition, and then another for net comp, and a third for rest comp. 
the process is com uh, completely decoupled, uh, much like the NMDA work. In fact, if we were to do this, we might consider moving that general definition draft to the net mod working group. Uh, the cons there's the, there's more drafts. So any comments on this in the very few minutes that we have remaining? Blush, I see you're still in the queue. Do you mean to be, or did you just not exit the queue? Didn't forgot to exit. It's the hand icon in the upper left corner. Okay, I don't see any comments. So Mahesh, there is just one more slide, and now I know we're out of time, but I just quickly can we do that next slide? Um, so I have uh, so those are the protocol independent questions. I'll take that and them all to the list. Uh, for RESTCOM specific, uh, I do. And then there's another slide for NetConf, but there are no. I don't have any NetConf specific questions. So there's this is truly the last slide, if you will. Um, the question is, what should the scope of the leaf uh, um, and the leaf lift list targets be? Um, and, and in particular, are we just doing the get method, which would be the minimally invasive type thing? Because after all, we're talking about list pagination, so it's just get that we're talking about. Or should we uh, define leaf? I'm sorry, I said leaf. I meant list. List and leaf list, uh, those two um, nodes as being um, targets for all HTTP methods. So not just get, but post, put, delete, patch, etc. cetera, um, all of them. So, you know, the, of course, the considerations are, you know, for increasing the scope would be it's, it's more complete slash pure, but you know, I question there's actually little value. I mean, putting or posting or patching to the container is equally good. You never do you need to actually target the um, the list itself. Of course, that's uh, known or is shown but and illustrated by the fact that we don't do it today. Um, I, I think delete actually has a benefit. You could delete the entire list at, at one go uh, as opposed to, you know, in case it hasn't been wrapped inside of a, a dedicated container. Uh, you know, instead of having to delete the entire container, you could delete the entire list that way. So this delete has some benefit. Um, but it is, like I mentioned, it's kind of out of scope. The focus of this work is to introduce list pagination, which would only be the get method. But, you know, while we're here, should we expend, extend to support other methods? Any comments on that, or should I take it to the list? All right, I don't see any comments on that. I will take it to the list. And uh, yeah, like I mentioned, there there are no, there was another slide for RESTCOMP, but there was nothing there. I was just asking if anyone had any comments. And then there was just a thank you um, slide at the very end. That concludes everything for this meeting. Um, so switching my hats, taking off my contributor hat, putting on my chair hat. Um, thank you everyone for joining and um, Hash, do you have any comments? Closing comments? No. I don't. Thank you. I know it's late for some folks. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you, everyone. And we'll uh, <laughs> virtually see you next time or on the list before then. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. It's kind of funny. I'm looking for a way to end the meeting, but I don't think the options there. It's just we just exit. We just leave the room.